Please take your Bibles and turn with me once again to the Epistle to the Romans, chapter 8. We continue working our way through Romans. Romans chapter 8, picking up this week with verse 28. Very well-known words that come from the Word of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom He predestined, these He also called. Whom He called, these He also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? We've just left a, a passage last week in verse 27. We're left off with the sentiment that the apostle and therefore we, the reader and the hearer, are to be convinced that God absolutely loves us and cares about us and knows us so deeply that it's beyond our imagination. Now, when you are convinced that someone loves you and has great wisdom, someone in your life who you know, you know loves you, but also has more life experience, more wisdom than you perhaps, and, and cares about you deeply, with all that combined, you are more likely to pay attention to their advice and to what they have to say to you. You are more likely to trust that person, not just because of their experience, but more because you know them intimately, you know they care about you, and you know that they have your back and they're there for you. Now, interestingly enough, we're stubborn sometimes that we still want to avoid and ignore those people. But when we are drawn to the right mind, when we're drawn to the right attitude, when we come to our senses, as it were, we grasp the fact that this person has our best interest in mind, and it now becomes easier to listen to that person when we consider their deep and passionate love. Now, consider that same sentiment when it comes to the infinite wisdom, the infinite love, the infinite care, the infinite experience, the infinite knowledge of Almighty God. And we approach verse 28, grasping verse 27, and now reading these words, we hear them, we meditate on them, we read them, and we have to throw away all the baggage that often comes with them of them being overused, of them being a cliche, of them being misapplied, of them taking, being taken out of context, or of them being used without any real depth of explanation. The apostle starts off and says, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Most people can shrug their shoulders at that and say, that is not my experience. If you even talk to many Christians, they'll look at that verse and say, I can't claim this as an absolute in my life. And it's unfortunate that many Christians would even say that because the reality is that once the scripture is known as a whole, and it makes certainly makes a lot more sense. And it certainly is consistent. And it certainly is powerful. And it certainly is absolutely true. I have at the top of your outline the words of John the Baptist. When John the Baptist comes to preach, he says, the kingdom of, God, of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight, he quotes from Isaiah. And in a sense, that instruction is part of the good news of the gospel. Yes, the Lord Jesus Christ has come because of his deep love, because of his deep passion, because of what he did for you, because of God loving the world so much, he sent his son to die for you, that you believing in him should not perish but have eternal life. But then believing on him, you are to walk as he walked, to, to live after him, to prepare the way of the Lord, to make his path straight, to understand that, but also to conform your life unto that. And so when our lives are in conformity to Christ and to his goodwill and to his word and to his glory, then all things start to become more consistent, more orderly, more understood. And all things do work out for his good. 
as I said already, with verse 28, we're talking about a verse that many people have been soured by. Unfortunately, people have used this verse when people are in some of the greatest depths of woe and sorrow and struggle. And they use it in a light way, where they use it as if just quoting this verse should instantly make someone feel better. Well, we want that good in our natural hearts and in our natural state to be our good. When we read a verse like this and we say everything, now we know that all things work together for good, we usually will stop right there or people will stop right there and say, well, what good? My good? If all things work together for good, then why haven't I won the lottery? Then why haven't I made it big? Then why don't I have a, 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 a better relationship? then why don't I have more things? Then why aren't I moving forward in life? Why do things seem so stagnant? Or why do things even sometimes seem to be moving backward? If God is real and he says, we know that all things work together for good, then I'm lost, I'm confused, I don't understand. Well, the scripture must always be understood in context and must always be taken as a whole. All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. I must understand that Scripture teaches that my way is not God's way, and God's way is not my way in my natural state. But God's way, when it becomes my way and overwhelms my desires and my passions and overwhelms my heart, and when my life is Christ, then I understand that all things work together for good for good to those who are called according to his purpose. We've spoken a bit before on the called. It's those whom God has reached out to. It's those whom the call of the gospel goes out to, who the call of the mission goes out to. And with that calling comes a selection where God essentially lays his hand on you and says, you are mine and I am bringing you to life. I am taking you from death. I am taking you from bondage to sin. I am taking you from the wastefulness of life. I am taking you from destruction. And I am raising you up. And I am giving you salvation. And with that salvation comes a mission, comes a purpose, comes a calling, comes a reason for existing, and comes eternal glory for all that you set out to do in my name. The called, the one who hears God's voice and answers that call, it's a response that signifies recognition of the caller. I'm not just doing this to please those people around me who I want to gain attention from. I'm not just doing this for money. I'm not just doing this for my own comfort. I'm not going to make my life this way because it will bring satisfaction. And when I'm old and can't do anything anymore, I can look back on my life and say, look what I've accomplished. No, no, no. I'm doing this because I have been called by God. I recognize that Almighty God has made his voice known to me, has made that conviction known to me. And I want to serve him. And in that response, and in that passionate calling, comes a clear demonstration of love for the Creator. All things work together for good to those whom God has called to be his own. And with that calling, he gives us a love for himself. He gives us a passionate and deep love that we ourselves could never stir up or create in our own corruption, in our own sin. When we talk about a love for God, or when we talk about the love of God even, what can be said? What can be put into words that could really capture the love of God given to us in Christ, and then the love for God that he himself gives us to be able to show back to him in life and in service. What could be articulated that could do justice to the real concept, to the real power and affection of all of this? In Psalm 63.3, I read on Tuesday night that the psalmist will express that the loving kindness of the Lord is greater than life itself. And we're struck by that. Because once again, that is so far beyond our ability to comprehend and to grasp. That is so far beyond our ability to absorb and to make our own. And yet, the loving kindness of God is greater than life because without it, 
there would be no life. Somebody, we can say, well, I've only known life itself. How can I compare it to something else? But life itself is based on the loving kindness of God. It comes because God, before the foundation of the world, in love created you, made you, formed you. He formed humanity after his own image. We mucked that up. We have messed that up. But the loving kindness of the Lord still has not left us in that, has given us redemption, has given us salvation, has called us out of that. And he says, all things are going to work together for good to those who love me. When my way is your way, then you will know the goodness that comes with the love of God. We're told as part of the gospel message to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but also to die to yourself, to take up your cross and follow him. The Lord Jesus says the greatest commandment is to love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. How is that possible for us to do by our own strength or by our own muscle or our own ability? God must give us that. God must do us that. And so he calls us to that and he gives us that. And once we have experienced and known that, then the love of God compasses us all about. And we know his goodness and we know his care and we know his, his delight and we look to live for him. In living for God, in loving God more than self, we want to die to any identity that would be put above Christ, to anything that comes into conflict with our Lord and Master. The element of the gospel that tells us this is a difficult one. It's a struggle to be sure, but it's certainly one that we are not alone with. We've spoken previous weeks about the presence and power of the Holy Spirit to guide us in this. We've spoken before about the exercise of walking with the Savior and of living in Him and delighting in Him. And self-denial is an aspect of the gospel. I give all to Christ. I donate all to Him. He is my Lord. He is my Master. He is my Savior. He is my righteousness. He is mighty God. And His love dominates, and therefore His good dominates. All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called, but called according to His purpose. I want to live for my Lord. And when God's purpose is your purpose, you always get your way. For God's will is always done. Those who are called to his purpose, that means that there is a conviction. There is a conviction that life must be lived for God. Now, we can weigh this back and forth and say, look, I know the calling of God. I know the love of God, I know the conviction of God, but I am sometimes feel that with the power and might of God, there is a struggle that may come of potential uh, passivity and hardness in life. If all things work together for good and God's will is always done, then how can I stay away from being passive or from being hardened or from being aloof? God himself in his mercy, in his character, in his passion will not allow that to happen. If you are staying close to the scriptures, if you are staying close to the character of the Lord Jesus, you will see that sympathy. You will understand that mercy. You will understand that power. You will understand that passion. You will understand that relation that the Lord Jesus demonstrated where he weeps for the, the loss of a friend, where he cares for those who are in need. If we are truly grasping and embracing our Lord and loving him and understanding him, then yes, his will will always be done, but we will also understand the, the passion and the sympathy and the emotion that he expresses as well. For all of this, we know that all works together for good to those who are his, to those who love God and have put him first. In verse 29, we're told, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. 
this whole understanding of life working out together for good, of all that happens to you, everything working together for God's good, for His glory, and for the advancement of, of, his, uh, of his understanding and of His kingdom, and for your growth in Him, also comes with an understanding of how this all works its way back. All things work together for good to those who are gods. Well, who are gods? What is that understanding? Let's get some understanding and some teaching on that. With this teaching on God's goodness comes an understanding of conforming to Christ, which is part of the Christian life. We wonder about the working of God on our life. But yet, when we make, when we, when he is making us more like himself, we know that we can see his power evident in the church, evident in our sanctification. If we can think back to who we were when we were very young and early believers, or who we were right when we were questioning God or questioning the gospel and grasping what this could possibly mean, if we think back to our attitudes, to our actions, then we know that now, however much time is later, could be days later, we have already started to see a change. And that change is part of God's leading us to himself, conforming us to himself. But the interesting and wonderful thing about the conformity to Christ as part of the gospel and a part of God's working is it's not a, a puppet mimicking imitation of Christ. If someone set out to say, I am going to live my life exactly like the Lord Jesus. It would be impossible to do. Not only because we just don't have enough information about his every day, but also because he was holy God as well as holy man. There's no way we could be exactly like Jesus. So being conformed to Christ is an attitude of, I am unique. God does know me. God does make me different. He made me who I am. But yet Christ in me brings that character and that element of Almighty God to, to diversify my life and to, to build up my life in Him with the Spirit, with His power, with His character, with His personality. Yet all that is of God in me that is not sin is also used, is also brought to bear, is also made uh, unique to build the kingdom of God. And that's what we have where, we, we were talked, where he talks about those whom he foreknew. See, you are not a machine or a robot. You are not a programmed computer chip. You are known. You are known in your uniqueness by your creator. And before the foundation of the world, who you are as a person was acquainted with your creator and your master. To know someone is to have great familiarity. And we are told here that uh, our life is not a, a shock or a surprise. Our struggles, our gifts, our energies, our pains, our desires. These things don't surprise God. These things don't say, well, he doesn't look at us and say, well, I didn't know you were going to be like that. I didn't know you were going to turn out this way. No, no, no. He knows exactly who you are and what you're dealing with. And those who he foreknew, no matter the sin, no matter your life, no matter who you are, he's still predestined to save you. He still said, that person is mine, and I am going to take and redeem and use that person. He knows all, and he knows everyone. He foreknew. He predestined those he foreknew. Now, before we get everybody up in, up in arms about the complexity of predestination, let's just stick to what he's talking about here. He knows everyone. But we know that some are saved, some profess Christ, and some people die rejecting and cursing Christ. The people who, have, who know Christ are the ones whom God has made his own. They are the ones who he predestined to life eternal. 
And the ones that curse and reject Christ are not his elect, are not his called, are not the ones who are his. And the truth is that many do die cursing Christ. And these are people who have rejected him, who have turned away from him. But you who profess his name, you who come to him, you who know him, you who have answered the call, you who are sitting here right now and are so over and are so certain of the truth of this word, of the truth of the gospel, the truth of your salvation, you were known, you were predestined, and you were called unto God. And only God had the ability to save your soul. Only God could bring you to himself. And only those who come to him can live to be conformed to him. We are under his great sovereign grace and power and under his great insurmountable love. It's complicated, but when it's not overthought, it's also mostly simple. God loves us, and he's called those who are his to himself. And in being predestined and in being conformed to the image of his son, part of the aspect of that is his sons and his daughters are going to resemble the family more and more. He says, um, he says, for those he foreknew, he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, that Christ might be the firstborn among many brethren, that he might be the elder brother, as it were. And though not the exact same person, as I already said, the family resemblance and the family traits are definitely there. And the more we live in Christ, the more like him we're going to look and we're going to be. Again, this is the interesting part. As I said, different people, but still those kingdom traits. And you could see it in your own family. If you've got siblings or you've got relatives, you can get together and you can notice all the family similarities and the similar traits that are there. And yet there can be tremendous differences. My brother and I are very different. Right now, he's in Europe for like the fourth time. For me, when I leave Somerset County, it's a big deal. We're different in a lot of ways, but when we sit down, we still have those family traits. They're just there by blood. And that's what happens in the church. Unity and diversity. Differences, yet unity in Christ. He makes his children alike in their difference. And it's a wonderful, beautiful picture of the body of Christ. We can see our walk and we can see our progress in him. And all we can do is give thanks to God and praise to his name that he is conforming us day by day into the image of his son. Because he knows us, he's called us, we are his. And that's a beautiful and wonderful thing to live in that security where his good is done in our lives. In verse 30, he says, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. The beautiful thing about all of this is that God's way is secure and unshakable. Those who are predestined, those who are called, those who are justified, those who are glorified, are all part of this work of God and have received the greatest guarantee of security of anything else in existence. Every other experience that you have on this earth, that is of this earth, that is of this world, has a temporary aspect to it. The greatest, most passionate human love, even if that love of the heart never goes away, there is a day where there will be separation of sorts for a time. The greatest, most secure contract that could be signed and sealed can be broken with a court ruling of some sort, or some law can change. The things of this world, earth shift back and forth. The things of this world shift up and down. They change. They go. They change with the culture. They change with the times. But your salvation never changes. Those who he called, these he's justified. Those he's justified, these he's glorified. There is no getting away from that. There is no backing out of it. Jesus himself says in John's gospel that none can be plucked from his hand. The misunderstanding that Christianity is a fear-based faith is a horrible misunderstanding. And my stomach becomes queasy when I think of people in history who have presented Christianity as a fear-based faith. 
In other words, believe and obey, or God may take away your salvation. Or only live for God out of fear of hell. Or live for God as some sort of fire insurance, or earn, your, earn the pleasure of God in some way. That is all a message from the pit of hell. That is a lie and deception and has nothing to do with the good news, the gospel of, of Christ and of Christianity. Certainly we approach God with a holy reverence and fear and a holy awe, but not a cowering terror in that if I slip up or if I wander too far or if I do the wrong thing or if I don't love hard enough or love closely enough or go to church enough that my, that my soul will be in, in, in trepidation. No, no, no. Those who are Christ's are His, and you can never be taken away. His way is secure and unshakable. And in all things working together for good, you have a security in knowing that even when it doesn't appear good at the time, God has not abandoned you, and God has not given up on you. See, God is always working on you for your eternal application and for an outworking of his glory and grace. Security makes a, for a better relationship, not a worse one. When you know that God will never leave you, forsake you, or abandon you, you are more at ease and more comfortable in your walk and your relationship with him. Think about, parent, think about parental relationships. Yes, you want a parent who understands that there is discipline. But if the child is only afraid of their parent and can't talk to that parent and doesn't have any relationship other than commands with that parent, well, there is going to be some distance created. And I would venture to say that that would be an unhealthy family dynamic. And that is not how our God relates to us. He relates to us in a very warm and compassionate way. The Christian always needs to know the security of God. But the Christian also has to have a grasp that their life and their mission in that security has eternal application for God's kingdom as well. The Christian needs to be careful to avoid a philosophy of that emptiness and apathy. Well, God saved me. I guess that's it. I guess we're done here. I've got nothing to prove. I've got nothing to show. I'm his. He is mine. I guess I'll worship him and that'll be the end of my relationship. No, no, no. Everything you do has an eternal significance. Remember, when I'm talking about your uniqueness, that's not by accident. Your talents, your gifts, your abilities, all that makes you up, he is using to build his kingdom and that will be, and that will have significance and that will have a role in glory. He justifies you, he calls you, and he will glorify you. And when he glorifies you, you don't abandon all you've done and who you are. Remember, we are told that our Father who sees in secret will reward us openly. Remember, we're not here to do things for people's pleasure. He sees in secret, but he also sees what we do in public, and he will reward us openly. He is the one who's going to deal with it. He is the one who's going to apply it to his kingdom. He is the one who is going to give us all that he deems fit to give us. And we are to be satisfied with that in our security and in our love and in our relationship with him. People may ignore you, but God never will. People may reject you. But God will delight in who you are. For those who love God and those who are called, everything works out for his good in your life. God is for his own. For in the last verse we read, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? In that security, in that love, in that calling, in that goodness, in that good news, we know that when we are on God's side, then there is no such thing as failure, no such thing as defeat, and your enemies are as dust in the wind. We sing a song that says, Be still, my soul, the Lord is on my side. Well, the Lord is on your side when you are on his side. And if your will is his will, then all is good and all is for his glory. For he owns you and owns it and owns your life. And that's the best place to be. That's the most content place to be. That's the warmest place to be. That's the most delightful place to be. On the straight and narrow path, all things work together for good. When God is your life, his way is satisfaction, and nothing can come up against you. The gospel is a glorious message of good news, 
of grace, of faith, of Christ giving himself and dying for you, of raising again on the third day, of having victory over sin, death, and hell, of ruling and reigning at the right hand of God, and in working to conform us unto his image, that he might be the older brother, he at the head, we at the body, and the church of God advancing, being sanctified, looking to the day when we are all glorified, and loving and delighting in the good news and in God's working for good. Let's pray. Our dear Lord, thank you for the encouragement of the gospel, and thank you for helping us to understand that when we are in your will and conformed to you, when we have our, a love for you as first, with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, as best as we are humanly able to do that, and we understand that there is nothing that can come up against us, for you are for us. And when you are for us, we know that all, even when it may not seem like it in the small blip of time, all works together for good. Because you love us, and we love you, and we want to see your good done. And so we pray that your good would be advanced among us, and applied among us, and received among us. And that we indeed could serve you as we delight in you, and look to you, and rest in you, and grow in you. Please apply all of this, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.